let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we're still passing out some things. Don't get overly consumed by those. We will uh, talk about those here in just a little bit. And uh, so hopefully you won't get your uh, your twinkiness and uh, all that healthy food that you're all eating all over that. <laughs> Hey, I want to pray and then get us started, if we can do that. Uh, actually, prayer is our start. And uh, so let's pray together and um, petition God to speak to us this morning. Ask Him to help us not be distracted by tiredness or the things that need to still be done tomorrow. This is important prayer for myself. Uh, it's been a crazy, busy week. We'll talk about that a little bit. And uh, so let's just spend a little bit of time in prayer. We've got lots of our leadership academy folks are out for various reasons. Um, I won't go through all of them, but just a couple. You know, Jason and, and uh, Stacy Smith are getting to see Joey. They're, they're very, very, especially Stacy, very excited to see her little boy uh, who's in uh, basic training right now. And so that's a, an exciting thing for them. And the Wheelers. Uh, Heather's doing pretty good, which is great. Uh, Dawn had to work today, but uh, she's had all kinds of steroids and things as she goes through her uh, superpower um, transition, is what she's talking about, you know, from Spider-Man with her radiation therapy and stuff. So what she keeps talking about is really funny. But, uh, so she, all kinds of steroids, so she just needs to rest, and I think we're all okay with that. Uh, for her to kind of hang out, she said she'd be good mom, so... Uh, then my my Jennifer is at home because today is Jake's 13th birthday, and so that's good. So we're gonna hang out and do some stuff tonight. But we figured at least one parent should be home <laughs> for the morning because you know Jake could set the house on fire. So that, you know, it's, it's more than anything. That's it. I said I told him this morning. I'm so sorry that I'm not there. And he's like, oh, it's okay. I can stay busy. I was like, I know you can. <laughs> I know. So, you know, we've got several that are out for various things. So we're just going to pray together and, um, and just enjoy this morning together. So let's do that. God, we thank you for life. We thank you for another day. We thank you for friends and family. We thank you for this church community. We thank you for the things that you have done. You have done amazing, amazing, amazing things. So just for a moment, contemplate coming up on a three-year anniversary and just looking out and thinking about what we're even doing right now amazes me and blows my mind. But we affirm continually that we know it's not because of something that we have done. It's not because we uh, can accomplish these things on our own because we can't. It's too big of a story to ever imagine that it was just a group of people that worked hard to make it happen. We have had lots of people work hard. The people in this room and many others who have poured their lives into this and their time, energy, and money. We're so thankful for that. But you have poured your life, your resources into this place in ways that uh, we just can barely comprehend. It's because of all that that we're having this time today to talk about where we are, and where we've been, and where we're going. And we just pray that you open our mouths, that we will say the things that need to be said. Regardless of any outline that we have planned, we just pray that you have your way here and that you speak. And that you do what you want to do because this is your church. And we want to be your church, your people, lovers of God, disciples who make disciples, following your will and your word, being led by your spirit. So we invite you here to move in this place. We pray for those that aren't with us today for whatever reason, whether it's out of sickness or um, celebration with family. We uh, just pray that you move in their lives today as well. So God, help us to not be distracted today. Help us to be fully present, fully awake, not consumed by the things that have happened this week or the things that need to happen later today or tomorrow. We pray for an amazing day tomorrow. We pray that you bring lots of guests. We pray that you assemble our church family together, that you remove barriers and excuses, and that we can come together and worship you as one. 
we could be unified in you, surrounded, surrounding the cross, and looking up to you to ask you to move in us, to change hearts, to bring salvation, maturity, and growth. So God, we praise you for all of these things. In the name of Jesus. All right. Well, we have lots of things to talk about because um, it has been just such a busy season. Um, last time we were together, one of the things that we did uh, was that we asked you to uh, begin trying to plug yourself in. One of the things. We talked about lots of different things. But one of the things that we did was to ask you to plug yourself into different places to serve or to lead. And uh, Kirk and I spent a lot of time this week uh, digesting through that. Originally, originally we had um, uh, told you that we might call on some of you see people to help us digest through it. But when we started looking at it, we realized that it was probably something that was going to need to take place over the course of many days in digesting through it. And that's exactly what it was. It was like, we didn't want to punish you. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. John, you might need to turn his mic up a little bit. I think if you turn it up on the actual uh, radio unit on the front, the far, far dial on the side. I think the reaction of everybody that came in the office was good. all wow, what is this? There's all these ministries and people, and this is a big deal. Yeah, we... Uh, it was a whiteboard excursion to try to figure that out. Drop that's why all the words keep going on the floor. Here we go. Oh, that's done. That's very good. Thank you. Um, so, so we decided not to punish you to really try and get through it. We're still not completely there. I mean, it took days um, and tons of time, of prayer, and we'll admit to you, uh, there were times along the way that we got so tactically focused. We would walk in the room and just start talking and digesting through it, and we'd get into it about an hour ago. You know, we really need to pray. And, and, um, and that happened to us several times this week, and I think that's a, a good warning maybe for all of us that to not get consumed by the tactical side of anything and to remember that really where we've got to start is we need God's wisdom in all of us. We've got to start and remind ourselves, you know, we've, we've got to pray petition God to speak and move things along. And, uh, and because it's a busy season, it just is. This is going to be a really busy season. It kind of begins here. This is why I took sabbatical in July, because I knew once September got here, it's going to be a, a sprint, really, through the end of the year. Uh, now, I don't think October will be as bad, which is good. But you get into November, and holiday stuff starts happening, and then December. We all know what December looks like. If you were around uh, in our first December, we way overdid it. We were like, hey, we can do this on Tuesday, we can do this Thursday, and we can do this Friday, and then we'll do this on Saturday and Sunday, and then again on Monday we'll do this, we'll take Tuesday off, but then Wednesday and Thursday. I mean, it was like I wanted to die during Christmas time. I could not wait for Christmas to be done that first year. It was ridiculous. Anybody in here remember that? Amen. <laughs> so the second year we're like, let's take it a little easier on ourselves. And you know, I think we continue to get smarter as we go forward and, and more strategic. Like what do we really want to do and why are we doing these things? And uh, and we'll continue to do that. And we'll, and we'll talk about that more as we go through. But back to September, it's hard to believe it's September already. It is. We've got a couple more of these set of these sessions. Uh, we'll have one in October, and then we'll kind of have our makeup one in November to finish this up. Uh, and uh, But we have a lot to still accomplish. Where we really need to go now, especially with where we left off last time, uh, and talking about leadership and, and plugging into different places, is to really begin to move us toward a tactical side. Like, what do you do with it now? So if we were to say to you, hey, we've got this ministry to make balloon animals, which we don't. Someday we could. I mean, it wouldn't be beyond us. But we've got this balloon animal ministry. Uh, Robin Cooper's going to head it up. And, uh, and so, if 
So when Robin gets tapped to lead the balloon ministry, she would need some structure for how to begin. Uh, how do you begin a ministry from scratch? How do you plan through it and work through it and then put the pieces in play so you're not just constantly struggling to keep up. Instead, you're proactive rather than reactive. Because you know living in a reactive world is really challenging, no matter what it is, whether it's in your personal life or business life. But if we can be proactive and plan well and work well from a bibliocentric model, then we're way ahead. And so September then for us is about that. And what we're going to be doing with you is helping to be tactical and how to create things. And we just want to start that ball rolling today. Uh, and then we'll be contacting you and helping to put some meat on those bones and begin to develop stuff so that we're really fully functional here, especially by the beginning of the year. Now, a lot of ministries we do are functional. And we need to layer in some additional leadership and layer in some new processes and make them more efficient and run a little more smooth. Because, again, that's being proactive rather than reactive. The challenge here, and one of the greatest challenges we face always, is that Renew continues to grow so fast, we tend to be in a reactive mode all the time to some degree. Is that fair to say? It's sure. like we're constantly trying to keep up with God. And so this isn't necessarily trying to go, hey, we're going to pull one over on God. We're going to get in front of Him and be proactive. No, none of that. We don't, we don't want to be there. We don't want to begin to just make it up along the way. This is part of the sermon you're going to hear tomorrow. And I'll talk about that in a minute more. We don't want to just figure out what we want to do and then make it fit into a biblical model. And so there's one thing about being proactive, but there's another thing about getting in front of God. We don't want to get in front of God. We want Him to be leading us. We just want to keep Him in sight, though. We don't want Him to get so far ahead of us and we're either, you know, so ill-equipped in our own minds or we're just not working to do the things that we need to do to keep up. We, we want to be right there with Him and letting Him clear the path and make a way for us. And so that's part of what we're going to be talking about as we get, forward, get into this. Okay. So let me talk a little bit about September. So September, we're going to begin a new series. Um, tomorrow, we begin this new series. Now, the truth is, I actually started it last week. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you will receive power to be my witnesses. This is going to be a key verse for us for about the next eight or nine weeks. And I'll come back and I'll touch it. But it will actually be two separate sermon series um, over the next eight or nine weeks. This September, right now, starting tomorrow, is uh, We Are the Church. We Are Renewed. Um, I probably will tomorrow say, you've heard that, you know, we, uh, I am the church, or this is the church, this is the steeple, open the door and tell people. Anybody in here by show of hands ever do that when you're a kid or know what I'm talking about? Okay, so that'll go for you. Fine. Um, so I was a little worried. I was sitting there last night and I was like, I'm totally going to do that. But if like four people seen it, it will flop. <laughs> so this is the church, this is the people, the North Seattle people. I had to look that up on YouTube to figure out how to do it then. Because I couldn't remember. Because I was an even growing up. Your I did, I did, I brought it together. <laughs> Whatever. Hey, I was a heathen when I was a kid, so it's all good. This, this, you know, this is the church, this people, the North Seattle people. My, my rendition will be something more like, um, uh, this is not the church, the water towers are steeple. Um, open the doors to see other people. Something like that. I'm still working through it, but you know, it'll, you, you know the, the cabin water tower church steeple, right? Everybody right. with me? Right. Right. Okay. Because you know this history of steeple, right? And why, why we have steeples. Because you need to see where the church is in the middle of town. We have the biggest one in town. I love that. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. Now, who wants to climb up there in the middle of the night? Hey, you so later we're going to have an art contest of how you turn C A B O T into R E N E W. A little tap, it will be perfect. Anyway, so tomorrow begins. We are renewed. We're the church, and part of this is to begin to make a case for the community center. It's beginning to make a case for who we are. Now we already did a series on why we do what we do. It's very tactical. We had, you know, talked about uh, why we do communion and why baptism. 
you know, why do we sing, and those kinds of things. This is not that same series. This is really, what is our DNA? Who, who are we, and why, why are we this way, and where does it come from? And so part of that along the way is going to be talking about um, looking at the Bible and determining the things that we do because of what the Bible says. And there's a dramatic difference between where you start or end with the Bible in that. One way you can start with the Bible, you can look through it and take our cues of the things that we do tactically, the things that we do intellectually, from looking at the Bible first. We start there. Can I get everybody with me, please? I hate to be that school teacher. Just, let's not be distracted. Let's stay together. Okay? And so to start with the Bible is everything. We want to start there and figure out what we do and what we say from there, as opposed to let's figure out what we want to do and then let's go find some obscure passage in the Bible to make it fit. Does that make sense? Two totally different worldviews. And so when we begin to look through the page of Scripture, what does it tell us? How do we function? And are we doing what that says? Are we looking as much like the New Testament church as we can? Uh, and does the community center fit that model? Let me just ask you generically, what do you think? Yes. From what you know from Scripture, are we starting with a biblical, a bibliocentric model and doing the things that we do because of what the Bible says as opposed to just what we want to do? I think so. Now, do we have freedom in some areas and we can make, you know, like there's nothing in the Bible that talks about what kind of lights you should have and stuff like that. So there's freedom in some of those things. But as far as the overall heart of who we are and where we're going, we want to start there. But we don't want that just to be a way to start the church. We want it to be something that propels us forward and begin to communicate that to the church community as a whole. Uh, this is why community center. When you begin to look at the things that Jesus taught and did, which we talked about a little bit in the sermon last week. When, you know, he lives out what he was preaching. When we begin to do that, to me it looks a lot like what we're doing next door. The feeding, taking care of things, and doing things. We have objections to cover and to deal with, and maybe we should talk about some of those. Um, like for instance, one of the things I hear from people at times are, well this is just the social gospel of the 60s. I don't know if anyone has heard that before. Have you ever heard that phrase before? Well, that's the social, not necessarily about us, but has anyone ever heard that phrase? That's just the social gospel of the 60s. Anybody ever heard that phrase? Okay, a couple of them. And so, if you were to hear it, here's what they mean by that. Now, by the way, who would say something like that? They're generally church people that are old and angry. <laughs> angry, old church people. Um, and they would look at something like we're doing in the community center, they'd say, you're just recreating the social gospel. The social gospel, then, would basically be this. We're just doing good stuff because we want to do good stuff. It's, in essence, that's what it is. We just do good stuff, and it's good enough. Uh, it's a works-based mindset. We'll just do good things. Um, this is not the social gospel. I actually sat in a room with another pastor who looked me square in the eye and said, you know what some people are saying about you. <laughs> I was like, who knows, man? Uh, I, I can guess, would you like me to? It's one of about ten different things that I hear all the time. Uh, and he said, it's, people think that you're just recreating the social gospel and that you've grown so fast because you're just giving people food and clothes so they're coming to get stuff. But no change is taking place. And I basically said, you have no idea what you're talking about. None. You haven't been here. You don't know. You should basically just shut up. You have no clue. Um, because the mindset for many are trying to figure out how does a three-year-old church grow that way. And unfortunately, where most of the time they go are to negative pieces. Like, you must not teach the Bible. We've had so many guests in the last month. Um, it, uh, like, on average... 12, 13, 14, just in the last few weeks, kind of thing. That's unbelievable. And what I hear, and something has shifted in the last month from when I talk to people on the phone. What I hear from everyone now is, I love it and I'm, I'm coming back. Now, often I hear that about 50% of the time. I'll have someone go, man, it was great, I can't wait to see next weekend. I'll be there. The other half, like, it was nice. 
and then like one percent go, yeah, that's not for me. And I go, no problem. Would you like help finding a place that's more like you? Because I could give you some recommendations or something like that. And that's not being mean. It's just you know, if you're new to town, you can try this out. And you hate our music. Um, I'll give you some ideas where to go. Or if you hate my preaching, I will give you some ideas where to go. Like that. Oh. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I knew that was coming. I seriously, when, it, when he first said, you don't like my preaching, and I went, I know what's happening next. And it scared me. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm totally kidding. I, I'm kidding. I didn't plan that ahead of time. It just came out. I went to Rex Center. You can No, I'm just kidding. I don't need more coffee. It was like a softball. I could just see it. It's like, oh, here it comes. The whole thing is boom. Yeah. You're just going to smack it. Okay, but the, so the last month, everybody, everybody, they cannot wait for the next day. They're showing up on Friday night to the coffee shop, and they're coming to Bible studies during the week. All that. these people, like like a couple weeks ago, job with Jen, and I think it was three weeks ago, she had two ladies come who had just come that Sunday for the first time. That's kind of amazing to me. You come to church for the first time and like you jump into a, a women's Bible study the same week. I've not generally seen that. People are just hungry. And by the way, the other thing that I constantly hear is, you actually teach the Bible. Now, I know I've talked about that with you, but the last month I've heard it over and over and over and over again. As people are walking out the door, people are going, you actually talk the Bible. Yes. And I want to just say, and I have said it several times, what did you expect? Because I really want to know. I really want I don't do it every time. What did you expect to hear? And the answer was, well, not that. I just expected your contemporary church and it'd be just, you know, more just easy, fluffy, like not real, but just, you know, a feely kind of thing. It's all about me. <laughs> it's all about me. <laughs> Vanity. No, anyway, that's not how the song goes. Don't sing it that way. The Great I Am is not about you. <laughs> Exodus 3, read it. It's a good place. Anyway. Um, but that brings up something interesting. So one of the things on this, as we're talking about who we are, is continuing to convey that message. And putting those words in your mouth to help people understand this is really who we are. We are the church. We are the walking, talking testimony of Jesus. And it really is based on Scripture. And something's going on and the world's hungry for it. I don't know if it's because the world's on fire right now. I don't know if you noticed. Yeah. And we're going to probably talk about that a little late. The world's just a mess right now. And maybe there's a little spiritual awakening happening. People are hungry. But what's interesting too is a lot of people who have been coming lately are not the unchurched crowd that we have grown from so much. A lot of these are the church crowd that are leaving other places because they've stopped teaching the Bible or they're teaching heresy or they're doing things that do not align themselves with Scripture and they're hungry to find somewhere that's teaching the truth. Something's changing in our culture, in this Cabot culture, in the environment. And it's going to be interesting to see what God does with that. Um, but we need to be prepared. And so part of this is talking about who we are, because here's the deal. I want people to know who we are. And if we're not the right fit, they need to go somewhere else. And that's okay. Um, there are going to be people that have been here for a long time, but as we continue to do things, like in the community center, we're doing things in a vital way, that there are going to be people on the way that are, get tired of that. And they don't want to hear about it anymore. And they'll go too. And guess what? That's okay too. It is. We don't want them to leave. But if um, they hate hearing the truth, if, if their heart can't be turned, that we have to be okay with them go if they choose to go. Does that make sense? That's really hard to do. Really hard. It hurts. Especially from a pastoral perspective from my perspective, who genuinely loves our people. And I hope you know that. And genuinely loves them. And when someone goes, it's hard, but if someone doesn't want to hear the truth anymore, and they want to their ears to be tickled, we go right to Scripture and we see that that's going to happen, especially as we move into a world more and more on fire. And, and so it's, we're going to have to be prepared for those kinds of things. Um, Interestingly, though, one of the other things that we've heard in the last couple of weeks, we got a really interesting uh, Nasty Graham letter in the mail. Now, um, I 
I have read several uh, articles over the years that say basically, if you're not getting any criticism from your community, you're not doing anything. <laughs> but still, when you open a letter and it, it basically says, you should go to hell, then that's really challenging sometimes. But we got this, it was actually a box, and it had some stuff in it, uh, and I'll explain what that was, and a two-page letter. It was like on note cards. It wasn't even a yeah. letter. It yeah. wasn't really even addressed as a letter. It was like random thoughts on two large note cards. Yeah. Not signed. Not signed. It was anonymous. Sent from Romance, Arkansas. That was where it postmarked from. And it went through line by line all the things they hated about us. Just, they thought the prayers were terrible and soft and weird. And they thought the music was terrible. They thought the idea that we were okay with people showing up with tattoos was heresy. And I mean, it was everything to match. They said that the way that I dressed was terrible in my maternity shirts. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy Bahama, bro. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm a little chunky around the center, but Tommy Bahama helps. I don't know what you expect. But um, that's probably the, is what that's probably the same saying. old guy that would go up to someone and go, What are you doing? I'm not pregnant. You know, it's that guy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for real. And so, um, but it was just one thing after another of just of loathing and hatred right. toward us. Except they like to treat you. That made it all okay, really. It was like, I hate all these things. Your preaching's good. But I hate you and I hate all this stuff. It was really weird. It didn't make any sense. It was incoherent, really. But it was full of hatred and religion. It was, it was the spirit of religion that said... You are doing it wrong. This is the way you should do it. And you are doing it wrong. You are not checking the right boxes. And because of that, uh, I basically handed you over the segment. It's kind of the essence of, of the note. Um, guess what? We're going to get criticism. We are. We're on the right track. Because we're looking to Scripture to say, guide us, lead us, we start there. We don't want to just come up with our best ideas and then figure out how to fit Scripture into it. Thank you for loving me. I appreciate that. <laughs> but we, 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 don't, we don't cave to that kind of thing because that spirit of vision, spirit of religion, um, it's out there. And it hates everything about freedom. Now, freedom can go too far. But we've got freedom in these things. We've got freedom to have new walls. Even though some others will hate it and think that we're, we should go to hell because of blue walls, which blows my mind, you know. Or that I can wear flop, floppy shoes or whatever. These are not the right mindsets. But I think you know that because if you didn't believe that we have freedom in those areas and that we're striving to have a bibliocentric model of who we are, you wouldn't be here. Right? right? And so, be prepared, though, because there will always be criticism. Especially when things are going well, there will always be criticism. And what's so weird is often the places that we'll take fire from are our own people, our own kind. Not necessarily our own reviews, but the church across the street or next door or whatever. Those are the ones which has been part of the problem of Christianity for a long time. Is that we'd rather shoot at each other and fail to go reach lost people who are going to hell. And um, that's a real challenge. I sat at a table last night here. Friday nights are very cool. You should come try it out. I love Friday night. But I sat at a table and just chit chatted with someone and heard their story. I love hearing stories. I heard the story of, you know, teen pregnancy and getting kicked out of church. And, um, you know, showing up to another church and um, uh, with this brand new baby and another lady had a baby about the same time, but the other lady was the traditional like, a, you know, husband, wife, new baby, and she's a 16-year-old with a baby. And after the service, uh, everyone went to go see the new baby for the, the married couple and ignored this one. It breaks my heart. Does. And these are the kinds of things, people, by the way, I don't think that would happen. Do you? Okay. Now, out of a church population of, I don't know how many people call their home now, 
many kids? 800 people? I don't know. I really don't. Are we going to have people along the way that are going to say hateful things and be stupid? Yes, until their DNA changes or until they leave because they can't stand it. Um, we're always going to experience some of that. But as we continue to communicate this message and why we're going to talk about things this month on who we are, why we are who we are, uh, we are the church, those kinds of things, and hopefully that filters through, um, there are people like her that are being pushed away and thrown away and walking away from God because they assume that, that God feels that way about them too. And we have God to continue to communicate this message that we're the church. And we're going to meet you where you are, but love you too much to love you instead. But, you know, once certain circumstances are what they are, we just want to love on them and help them to find the love of God and to grow. And yes, to be changed is like in, uh, when Jesus meets the lady who's caught in adultery. He doesn't say, now get up and go do whatever you want. He says, I'm going to sin no more. There's an expectation of change. But Jesus doesn't condemn her and throw rocks at her and kill her. He shows her love and mercy and grace and offers her a road of forgiveness. And this is important. But we're always going to have rocks lobbed at us and we're going to deal with that kind of stuff. If we're the place that everybody comes that we're already thrown out of all the other places. But I love to hear those stories. And so the month of September then, we're going to talk about We're going to talk about who we are, our DNA, and that will lead up to, and it begins again this Sunday, we're going to talk about a little bit of our story. Uh, you know, and most of you have heard the story, I think, you know, three years old in four days. Four, four days will be our official uh, three-year anniversary. And, yeah, and um, uh, you know, growing to to where we have, puts us in a place where we have to go to three services. And what a great place to do it on your three anniversary, three year anniversary to go to three services. And so we're gonna do that next weekend. We have to do it. We have no more room. That old standard of, you can grow to about 80% of your church, you know, of your uh, facility um, in a service. We're well into that 80% in both services now. Um, and by the way, it's 9-11. It is. On this clock, anyway. I don't know what time it is here. I think we should stop and pray. How about that? That's what I do all the time. God, thank you for what we're talking about. Just talking about what you've done. We're celebrating you. So here is we're reminded on 9-11 where you began this journey for us. Um, we just pray that you continue to do what you did. Continue to bring people that need to hear good news your truth. We will love people no matter where they are and show them mercy and grace and help to lead them and guide them to where they need to be in you. It's fully mature, strong believers. So God, we just pray for your guidance in that. We celebrate all that you've done and all that you're still going to do. In Jesus' name. Amen. And so as we go to where we're going, you know, it helps to hear the story a little bit. So let me just briefly tell you the story. And so, you know, we began, uh, and you might hear some of this this month, but I want you to hear a little bit of it, but when we began, uh, you know, we soft launched because we had these uh, Exploring Renew events at the bowling alley here in town uh, in the restaurant because they did not have the restaurant open on Sunday before they painted the hideous thing on their marquee over there. It actually looked like that in those days. And, um, and so we had these little gatherings called Exploring or New, and we had desserts, and we just vision cast. And we talked about who we were to become, what God was creating in us, what, he, uh, what we felt like He was saying that the church needed to look like in this culture. And we had lots of people that said, okay, we're in. And then they would say, but don't make us wait till September, because the idea was, well, we're going to launch in September. And these people constantly said, we don't want to wait till September. Let's do something now. That scared me to death. My immediate answer was, I'm not ready. And that's been the story all along. I'm not ready for three services to a certain degree, but God's with me on a couple of things lately where I'm going, yes, okay, I'll be obedient. <laughs> but... I don't know if you ever feel like that, where you just go, I'm just not ready. 
Uh, anybody ever been there? Like in ministry? I'm just not ready. Just not ready. It's a normal feeling. Uh, and I think often that's just God going, I know, follow me. And the religious place you hear Jesus say that to Matthew, who was probably not ready, but come on, follow me. And so I said, okay, we'll do this. And um, we jumped in to uh, a couple of worship services there at the bowling alley. And then we had one at a little church facility where a church had merged with another church. And we went in there and we had one service. But by that point, we'd already outgrown that building. And um, went in and said, okay, God, we're going to trust you for this. And we're going to take on... $3,200 a month or whatever it was for our rent in the strip mall over here by Larry's Pizza. And the walls were red and yellow, called it ketchup and mustard. So ugly. Oh my goodness. Like bright red and yellow. Uh, and it was painted with boat paint, so it was shiny, because uh, it had been in daycare, so the kid puked on the wall and just rolled right off of it. <laughs> and, uh, or pooped on the wall, whatever happens in a daycare. <laughs> so, um, and so, uh, and we just jumped in, and you know, people started showing up and drove. Continued every week. There were ten more people every week. There were ten more people. Uh, we did nothing. There was no advertising, none of that. It was our soft launch. We, we didn't put the word out at all. We said we're going to just do this thing. We're going to teach the Bible. And we're going to sing and worship and do communion, and, and people just kept coming, 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 and. Then, before we knew it, we were getting close to launching, and we were out of space. And we were like, oh no, we've got like 100, and I think at that point, like 130, 140 people that were coming consistently. We did not fit in the room. We literally, standing room only. People would stand across the back glass the whole time. There were no chairs. We didn't, we had like 100 chairs. And, you know, we'd have 130 people show up. And so we bit the bullet again. And, and by the way, our offering didn't even come close to covering our rent. I mean, it was just, but all these new people coming, figuring it out. I'm out on a trail trying to raise money so we can pay the electricity bill. You know, that kind of thing. Um, it was the most exciting and the most scary thing ever. And it was weird because it was so exciting and so scary all at the same time. The constant prayer was God send workers in the harvest and we send some of the money. You know that kind of thing. <laughs> but take care of it, please. And he always did. It was always just enough. Always just enough. And kept coming. And then we went, you know what, before we launch, because if we launch and we launch well, more people are going to come. And they're, they're not going to fit. We can't fit now. So we went and negotiated the next space next door to us in the strip mall. The guy begrudgingly let us take it. And so we finished service on Sunday, one Sunday. And as soon as the service was done, we started cutting drywall. And we broke through. Who, who here, who were, were here for that event? Some of those kind of things. Cutting drywall, cutting the, cutting the studs out, hoping and praying that the roof would not cave in in the middle where we took out this big wall that was really probably a supporting wall to some degree. That's okay. We had varying degrees of, of comfort. I would walk in there every Sunday and look at that thing. Be like, okay, I don't see any cracks. We're good to go. I'm really, I'm so scared. We took out this middle section. We built a stage, painted the walls, all in that one week. Talk about a busy week. It was ridiculous. Terrible, but glorious. And we bought more chairs. We had seating now for 200. And we, um, guess what? That next, that Sunday after we, we had our big event, uh, by the way, we think that you don't, uh, that I don't value sports things. We changed our entire launch plan because of the Razorback stand. <laughs> because someone did not even look at the schedule. I didn't realize there was a football game going on. You know, I don't care. But anyway, love me from who I am, it's okay. And so we ended up turning our Saturday night big event, our celebration thing into a Razorbacks watch party. We used our big giant inflatable screen and through lots of maneuvering and begging and crying, the, the actual game played on the big screen. And we had 400 people show up. And then we had over 200 people come the next day for church. 
we're instantly in two services, but again, we're back to, you know, it just grows and grows, and I'm going, we're in trouble, because now I'm looking at it to expand again, and the bank said, no way, we're not letting you take more space, and so I start driving around this town, saying, God, show me the building, it has lots of parking, it has a sprinkler system, this really was my prayer, you need a big building, 10 to 12,000 square feet, my prayer was 10 to 12,000 square feet, lots of parking, and a sprinkler system. So I prayed for it. And I kept driving by this building, and um, God kept prompting me, and he called me, and called me, and called me. Finally, I called, talked to the guy that owns, owned the building, owned it, past tense, owned the building. He said, I don't suppose you have 10 to 12,000 square feet with this, you know, with a sprinkler system and whatever, that you'd be interested in having a church there. And he went, sure, you want to see it? <laughs> and the rest is history on that. And here we are, three years, Ready for three services, uh, and we need to always be reminding ourselves: this is what God has done. This is His story. It's not because I can just maneuver these things, work this through. We're not that talented, uh, but it's because God has done it. And I really will tell you: I think part of why God has done all of this is because we continually honor Him and we honor His word. I do. There's all these stories that Jesus tells, and we see it just running throughout as a theme that when you're faithful with a few things, God will continue to bless you because He knows you can trust a few things. That's scary when you consider that that's people too. As God brings people, and we're faithful with that, and we're leading them to Christ, doing the best we can. Ultimately, He's the only one that can convert people. I can't convert anybody. Now, I can be a mouthpiece, and I can share, and I can talk and all that stuff, but ultimately he's got to do that. But we get to this point and we try to be faithful with the people he's given us, and he continues to bring more people. He continues to bring more people. And then people who are coming to be saved, they're bringing their friends, and they're being saved, which is amazing. Like this weekend, uh, tomorrow, we saying this weekend, like tomorrow's a long ways away. If tomorrow's tomorrow. <laughs> anyway, and so, this coming weekend, we finish on Sunday, but we see 24 hours. So, Anyway, but we have we have two baptisms. They say he's Christ. I, I do that. I think he's Christ. But we have two baptisms tomorrow um, because they came as guests of another lady who came many, many, many months ago who came to salvation. And now she's bringing her sister and her sister's daughter, and they're coming to faith, and they're baptizing tomorrow. Does that blow your mind? It blows my mind. It does. And that's just one story of hundreds, literally hundreds of stories of that. Um, and well, so, I want to say something real quick. I, I think of all these things that we talk about, take these things to heart because you are, as leaders, the mouthpiece of this. We tell this story, there's been some, obviously, some interesting um, YouTube slash Facebook stuff of a mega church uh, pastor, husband, and wife that would say things the pulpit that are just false. We, we don't tell the story over and over again because we want to glorify renew. We certainly don't want to do it because it glorifies uh, the Dunlaps or uh, all the people that work to plant the church, but it really truly glorifies God in all this. It really doesn't make logical sense. We really shouldn't be sitting here three years in. We just shouldn't. And I hope you understand how that really works. We just, we just shouldn't by man's design. By man's design, we shouldn't be sitting. When one of the things that we start to see as we work in the community center, we're starting, we'll talk a little bit about some of the things we're doing, but we're trying to bring in the community with the community center. We're trying to talk to other churches, to other pastors, to civic leaders, to other ministries. I mean, we're really working hard at that. And one of some of these pastors would just say, it's, it's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. But, <laughs> no, I do want to be safe. Um, what we hear and what we see, and there's this undercurrent of trying to explain why Renew has grown like it has. And it really is. I mean, there's all these kind of things. Part of that social gospel message was, well, Renew has grown because they do these things, right? They, they want to grow because they created a food pantry and they're going to give away food and clothing and, and that's a growth strategy. Right? I've got to tell you, I would never do that work. 
as a marketing strategy. It is hard work. It's hard. It's difficult. It's challenging. And I know Dixie and Natalie will give a big amen to that. It is, this is not a strategy or a tactic or a way to grow a church. And all this stuff that has been done as part of our story is not that either. And as we talk about adding the third service, you know, and, and coming up, not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow, where we add the third service, we would never design that. Ever. I mean, think about that. I mean, I know in my personality stuff, he may, he may be different in personality stuff. You know, I'm a C personality stuff. And one of the things that we do in the office, I put this calendar up, and we look at all the things that are coming up and kind of where to plug in. And I can really work hard trying to avoid what I call the Christmas of 2012, right? Which was, we got so much going on kind of stuff, right? I really, and when I look at that, when I look at what happened to September, we didn't design September like this six months ago. And when we, we really made a decision to go to three services, we had looked out for being farther out. Because why? It's hard, it's difficult, and it's stressful, and there's a lot of things that have to happen. And we would have never gone, hey, let's just, you know, for the sake of doing it, it sounds like a really good churchy thing to do. We need, you know, third service. God is prompting all of these things. I honestly believe that, or I would not wake up every morning uh, and know that there's just so many things that are going on at the same time. He's prompting all these things. He's prompting for a reason. And some of the reasons we don't know yet. But I, my, my point was about the story is, you know, take the heart that we're glorifying God in this story. We tell the story over and over again because it draws people into who we are and what we are and what we're about. And we're about following what God is telling us to do. Always. And if we have a balloon ministry, it will be because we open this Bible up and, and first Balloonionians, we will find that we need to set up a balloon ministry. Well, that was really good. Okay, you tell the jokes. Go ahead. <laughs> how, about, that how about this one? That what Paul talks about is, I will do anything it takes to reach a few. To the weak, I'll become weak. To the strong, I'll become strong. To the Jews, I'll be a Jew. To the Gentiles, I'll be a Gentile. I'll do whatever it takes to win some. Not sin, but I'll do whatever it takes. And if it really took a balloon ministry to reach lost people, we would totally do it. Now, we would not create a balloon ministry and then go, hey, by the way, does anyone know how to make balloon animals? We would find, as we pray for Luke 10 too, that God would send workers in the harvest. And as people come, they have skills, abilities, talents, desire to minister, um, and they just happen to be an expert balloon creator, then we really might do that. But it's not just to have a good time. It's because we want to reach lost people and see the lost saved and the saved grow mature. So I wanted you to hear that story and I wanted you to understand kind of where we've come from and where we're going. And to really, the main thrust of all this that we've talked about here for about 45 minutes is that who we are at our very, very core is Bible-centric people who want to do Bible things, Bible ways. And we want to honor God in everything we say and everything we do. Without these things, we are going to run a race that ends up nowhere. Or we run in a circle and we never accomplish what God has intended. Or we find out that when the starting gun fired, we ran the opposite direction. The Bible, we need to allow it to be our God and to thrive to let God speak and let His Holy Spirit lead us and we begin everything we do there. Because I'm confident this is how, why God has blessed us because we learn to do it. And honestly, I learn to do it more and more and more now, even, uh, because we've seen God doing these things and affirming, as I hear people say, I can't wait to come back because you teach the Bible, which is so weird to me. It is. It's weird I have so many people say those things. But yes, because we teach the Bible. I want to continue. Well, I think that when you prompt that, we hear that as a response, the room still. Yep.
Yeah, what she, if you couldn't hear what she said, it was, it's not just reading the page of Scripture, just, you know, but it's explaining it. And what does it mean? What does it look like? And how does it apply? That's why you hear so much at the end of my sermons on, so what? Why is this important? And now what do we do with it? Let's take it and run with it. And, you know, let it, let it move us and change us. Um, and this is part of why September is what it's going to be. Because as we get ready for this next season of ministry, it will give context for why. Like the sermon tomorrow is going to be making a case. Here's the case. Um, from an exegesis model, which is different than eisegesis, and I'll explain this tomorrow. Exegesis means you start with the Bible and you figure out what to do from there. Eisegesis is you figure out what you want to do and you find a passage to back it up. So we want to have an exegesis model. We start with the Bible. So if we were, and so you can ponder this question. If you were to um, not have any Bible knowledge whatsoever, have no experience with church whatsoever, and you just were to read through, just say the New Testament, just the New Testament by itself, or even just Luke and Acts together, and you read it like ten times, what conclusions would you draw about the church just from that? Without any of the baggage that we bring to the table of what we think church looks like, what conclusions would you draw? And the case I'm going to make for you is we would love one another. You would see that all the way through. That we would focus on things like communion and baptism. That that would be a running theme. That we would be healing, have a healing ministry. We'd be teaching. We'd be proclaiming the good news of Christ. And part of that healing ministry, would you see in there, if you had no Bible, no church knowledge at all whatsoever, and you just read Luke and Acts together, or Matthew by itself, or whatever, when you would conclude what was Jesus about, would you see in there, for real, would you see that he had a healing ministry, that he wanted to fix brokenness? And that wasn't always just healing lepers. Sometimes the healing was because they were hungry. And they just needed physical sustenance, and then he would teach them good news, because it's hard to hear good news when you start with that. That kind of thing. And when you look at that, what does it mean for the church today? Uh, and it means to put those things in practice, to start there. And that's what guides us and leads us. And that's going to be the same for all the ministries. And as we start talking about how we begin individual ministries, you know, how do we begin uh, a, a, a ministry like a, a um, food line? If we were to say we're going to start opening the doors, just as an example, I'm not saying this. We're going to open the doors on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And we're going to have a soup kitchen. We're going to feed people. How would we do that? Would it be biblical? Is there a bibliocentric model for that? And how would we create that with God at the head and leading that process? Those are the kinds of things that we need to get to. But again, the point I'm trying to make to you is that as we talk about any of these things, and as we talk about where we're going, it is to say, God, what do you want us to say? What do you want us to look like? Where do you want us to go? Lead us in all these things. And so let me talk for just a minute about the three services. And then um, um, one more thing, and we'll take a break. And we'll come back. And we're going to dig deeper on the Rethink Weekend, which is next weekend, and what that looks like. But again, the three services, this is not... A, okay, so let me admit this to you. When we moved into this building, there were a handful of people. Um, Terry Cox was probably the most dramatic one for that. Yeah, I'm calling you out. And, um, it's not anything unusual, sir. I know. It's because we did me earlier this week. It's pretty Anyway, and so Terry would say to me, as we were getting ready to move in the building, you know we're going to have to grow that building right away. Are you prepared for a third service? She would say, Jump like that to me all the time. <laughs> Which of your replies, shut up. Yeah. <laughs> Get a pastoral way. Get the behind me, Terry. Um, but here was my typical thing. She would say it, and I would do this. <sighs> it's pretty much exactly what I would do. I would up, and I would drop my head, and be like, come on. Part of that was out of tiredness. Because it has been a non-stop sprint for three and a half years. It's had. The idea of doing what we do a third time was exasperating. Um, because I'm going to let you in on a secret. Not all pastors only work on Sunday. <laughs> so the idea of adding more to that was just, it, it was like my flesh was so hard. So part of what I did in July, I went to um, the North American Christian Convention 
never been before, uh, but got invited, had a free ticket, so I went along. And Rick Warren spoke, and he said, one of the things he said was, uh, if your church does not want to grow, you are saying to the community, go to hell. And I, wrote, I was like, oh, that's a great sound bite. I'm totally writing that down, and I'm going to text this to a whole bunch of pastors who say, we're just happy being the best 80 people we can be. We don't want to grow. We don't want to reach out to lost. You know. And that, in my mind, so that's what I heard. Okay? So my little self-righteousness was all about, oh, I love it. I'm going to use that to blow other people up. That's perfect. Anybody else in here ever do that? Or is that just me? Okay, sorry. <laughs> Raise your right hand. Uh -huh. Now, with your left hand, show me who wants to also do that sometimes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it is. Uh -huh. Anyway, and so, so I heard that later in the week, I ended up hanging out with Craig Rochelle a little bit. The circumstances aligned. And we're talking, I'm talking about her name. I'm telling the story about where we are. And, uh, and we're talking about growth and kind of where we are. And then he just like hits me in the face with a two by four. And he basically says, you know, basically said, you have got to stop being scared of going to another service. He said, the only people that worry about not having their room full of people are you. The rest of the people in the room, they like that. They don't, you know, and the example is if you go to a movie theater and you walk in and it's 90% full. And you've got to walk through like 12 people to get the two seats that are trapped between two sweaty people. You know, you, you're not happy about that. He said, that is your ego that you want to only preach to a room that's full. Get over it. They want to come to a room that's 25 or 35% full. And immediately I heard Rick Warren's stupid face say, <laughs> You know, when church grows, you're saying you need to go to hell. And I went, oh crap, that was about me. <laughs> well, you should like it because he wears the same shirt. I know. He don't wear maternity shirts. <laughs> oh, by the way, I never explained it was in the box. In the box were two of the most hideous, ugly, um, like dollar rack um, Rick Warren shirts. You know, like flowers and all that stuff. I have no idea why the dude sent these in the box. Maybe he thought they were better than my wardrobe. They were marked down like 14 times on the head. <laughs> where we bought them though, like one of them seven dollars. It started out at 40 or something. And John wore one as a silent protest on Sunday. How much did you sell that? That hideous shirt that was from the package. It's from the box that probably had the nasty gram. Probably had license on it. Anyway, probably. Probably not. We're not good. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and so I really did. I had this aha moment. And I was like, of course I want the church to grow. But to be honest with you, it was like, I want the church to continue to grow. I want lost people to be saved. As long as we don't fit into services. Does that make sense? But I realized in that moment, that ain't going to work. And what old Ricky boy said there was to me. And I really did go, oh no. And I sent a text message to all the people that I had gone, oh, to, and repented. Because I needed to. And I do that to you too. Uh, if I've done that. And it, it was, okay, God, I'm sorry. Um, we will do whatever you want us to do. If it's six services, we'll do six. Well, and to think about how quickly all that happened right after that. We started getting 12 families on average coming every weekend. The room is full. We're encouraging people to go to first service and normally come to second service. Which has been amazing, by the way. Yeah, Almost been. even numbers, first and second service. Mm -hmm. it's crazy. I think God was preparing this. First, he had to solve the problem in this person's brain <laughs> to unstick that and go, okay, we've got to free this up. And then the rest of it's like, okay, now what do we do to make room for people? The world is on fire. It's turning upside down. You can see it. You, have to, you don't need to spend five minutes watching or listening to any news. Right? I mean, you just have to see it. It's over and over and over again worldwide. Uh, people are seeking the truth. We're a church that teaches the Bible. All at the same time, these families are coming, and we have to unstick the fact that we need to make more room for people because people are going to be seeking what is going on in the world. I don't think this is a little momentary blip. I'm quite sure of it. That when you see 
Americans, you know, losing their heads, Christians being persecuted in outstanding ways. It's, un it's just unbelievable. This is not a blip in time. I'm convinced of it. This is going to be something that will continue on and on and on, and people will be looking for truth. And we have to make space for that. And so it won't be far along before we have the fourth service. Yeah. I'm, I'm quite sure of it. Most likely by the end of the year. And, and um, maybe in the next couple months. Um, it just is what it is. But again, some of that paradigm needs to shift. Like we walk into a room and uh, into this room and there's uh, 50 people, 75 people. That's okay. And that's something I've had to work through in my heart. But that's not an unsuccessful service. Um, you know, 75 people show up. That's bigger than half the churches in Gabbard, Arkansas. So we've got to retrain the way we think that it's not a numbers thing and that your success is not dependent on how many people show up. And even as we talk about growth, it's not about, oh, look, we're so successful because so many people show up. Success has to be defined in a biblical way. Does God define success by how many people show up? No. But God defines success in a way of as lives change and as people are walking a new life and in the process of growing and maturing, that, that's how God defines success. Now, do we want to grow bigger numerically? So let me ask you, do you think we should want to grow bigger numerically? Yeah. Why? Most people are saying yes. Half of you don't know how to answer the question. Huh? Salvation hangs in the balance. It's not, and we will always have to guard our hearts there. You know, we're not growing bigger just so we can go where the fastest growing or we're the biggest church or whatever. We have to guard our hearts there because that pride will be dangerous and it will destroy. Instead, it's because we want more people to show up to hear the good news of Christ, be saved, and then grow and become disciple-making disciples and mature in the faith. So one day, can say what Paul said, I present each one mature. Christ. This is this. That's the business. That's what we're doing. So if it takes four services or five or six, whatever, we'll do what we need to do. God will provide. Will it be drinking from a fire hose? Yes. Then will we turn around and plant other churches? Yes. I'm confident that's what God is calling us to do. Is to spread the love and move that up. And we'll do that. And we'll do whatever He calls us to do. But let me tell you, in this season, it's going to be busy. Is it worthwhile? I hope you believe the answer is yes. Is it going to be busy? Yes. Are we going to get tired sometimes? Yes. We pray to not grow weary in doing good. We're doing good. But marriages are under attack because of the tiredness and the busyness of the season. Not just because of, of this, what we're talking about in three services. Marriages are under attack. Uh, relationships are under attack. Uh, Friendships are under attack. And here's the thing. We're going to disagree with each other on things. We're going to get angry at each other at times along the journey. Guess what? Here's what we do. We assume positive intent. We do things out of love because we love one another. We forgive one another and we move on. Being angry at somebody is not a reason to run away and go to some other church. That's baloney. You don't, do not see that in Scripture. We're a family, we work together, and we do our best to strive together to accomplish the same goal. Why did I tell you all this today? It's because we must be unified in what's really important and to do the things that are necessary to see the lost saved and to mature and to grow and to persevere and run the race well and finish the race well, which is what Paul strove to do. I want you to finish the race well. I want to finish well. I want you to finish well. So pray. Don't grow weary in doing good. We've got a lot of work to do. Agree? Agree. We cannot do it individually, but together we can. And um, do not grow weary. And if you are mad at me, talk to me. If I'm mad at you, I will talk to you. And we will forgive one another. We will hug. And we will move on because there's too much work to do to allow the devil to talk division and create strongholds and ridiculous things. But he will try 
and uh, he'll do it here, he'll do it uh, interrelationally, and he'll do it even just within your own family. Resist, resist, resist. Okay? So, we can sleep when we're dead. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Get rest, you can sleep, and um, um, we've got more stuff to talk about. Okay? So, let's take a quick break. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about the Rethink Weekend. So you've got about five minutes. Make sure you sign in as you're here today. Aaron Fozzie's got to sign the paper. And uh, we'll come back in about five minutes and then we'll talk about Rethink Weekend. Thank you.